Welcome to Bet the Edge. It's Wednesday, June seventh. Thank you, everyone, watching on our NBC Sports YouTube channel. I've got to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone except Mitch Keller of the <laughs> Pittsburgh Pirates. After losing those plays, uh, I got to take back my Pirates, uh, my Pirates ownership here. But uh, the Wellcappers joining me today. I am the Monday Sports. Uh, we have a doctor joining the show talking Ooh. about some horse racing. Doctor Gregory Barosa. and uh, Drew has some wake and cash in tennis as well as NBA Finals Game Three. Drew, I'm rocking the blue. For the Nuggets today, uh, how are you feeling? How's your week been going? And uh, NBA Finals Game Three, baby, it's game. I day. didn't. We didn't prep for this. I'm. I'm psyched to know that you're on the Nuggets. I played some Nuggets as well. Uh, it's taken me a long time to get here. Uh, the the <laughs> this this the pace of this series of the finals is just brutal. Uh, dying for this game to get here. It feels like we haven't seen these teams play in, you know, you know, a month, even though it's, I know it's only been three days, but, uh, yeah, two and a half is a bet. Uh, actually I laid three at plus 100, uh, because I do think that it, realistically, this is probably, uh, uh, a bigger margin if the nuggets do win. Uh, I don't think that the nuggets are winning a close one here. Uh, I think if you get their best and you know, you have a little bit of regression in any way, shape or form from the shooting that we saw in game two from the heat, then the nuggets can win this one by, uh, multiple possessions. So I laid the three at plus 100, uh, and I laid six and a half at uh, about plus 175. So going for a little mm -hmm. alt, uh, nuggets here in the hopes that if this is a nuggets win, that it's a comfortable one. So, uh, we are, uh, we, we ride with Denver in uh, South beach and cross our fingers that, uh, the nuggets get back on track. Well, if you're backing Denver to win the series, you certainly need them to win game three. Cause we know historically speaking teams that win game three, uh, win the NBA finals far more than, uh, often not, but I want to also make a dude. You talked about the pace of the series. We knew game one, you know, it's a, you normally bet for the over. I took the over and hit the under. We saw Miami come out kind of sluggish. The altitude playing that seven game series probably affected them. Went back on the over in game two, barely squeaked and cashed that. Uh, probably thanks to Miami's hot fourth quarter, you know, Duncan Robinson getting them excited. But I think the under is the best bet. I am on the Nuggets here uh, on their spread because you should, if you're taking, a team to cover, uh, you should be taking the favorite to cover, the underdog to win outright, if that's how you're doing it more than often than not. Most times, that's how it's going to happen. And with Miami, I think, being uh, such a good home underdog team, I think there's time for that to turn around, especially with Denver uh, losing their first home game, Drew. So I'm on the under. In six out of eight quarters for Miami, they've scored 26 or fewer points. Um, any opinion on the over-under? I lean with you under, but I passed uh, largely just because I have huge questions about what the Nuggets intend to do in terms of pace. We saw them push pace against the Lakers, and and it was extremely effective. And on, uh, in the back of my head, I worry that Malone goes to the well uh, as his kind of primary adjustment for this game. And so um, I do think, though, that an under is – probably correlated with the Nuggets cover by margin <laughs> because yeah. we know Miami wants to slow it down. And if they are specifically playing like, you know, like, you know, try to, to aggressively defend the transition and if they are uh, doing an especially good job of, uh, and, but, but at the same time there's regression with their three point shooting, then uh, all of a sudden this could be like a one Oh nine, you know, eight ninety one Oh nine ninety nine kind of game. Um, so yeah, with you, with you leaning under, but uh, only way I have attacked it in terms of bets that I have made has been late the points with the nugs yeah outside of game two for miami i mean their offense has really struggled for what three four straight games uh, outside of that one so i definitely expect them to be limited in the three-point department denver's gonna have to lock in somewhat you know they went 13 of 39 in game one uh and they shot 48 percent from two uh, from three in game two so that'll likely uh simmer down but uh drew my question to you is we were on the nuggets minus one and a half series price uh, now we're getting a better price at that, plus 115. The Heat's right now plus one and a half games at minus 140, the favorite. Uh, if we both believe the Nuggets win game three, now is the time to get back in on the Nuggets series price. Am I correct? I think so. 4-1 um, still live in my mind. Uh, I, I just, I having rewatched now game two a couple of times, that felt more fluky than anything. Um, very disappointed in the Nuggets defensive scheming and some of their, you know, just mental errors that they've made defensively. And so far in this series, those look fixable to me. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, not impressed with some of the offensive scheming that uh, Miami's bringing into the uh, mix here. And oh, by the way, like, you know, we don't really know if he, Tyler Hero is going to be you know, reinserted into the lineup, but the idea that he's going to be rusty and or a defensive liability yeah. is a factor. So uh, I think in, you know, all told Nuggets, it's uh, still winning 4-1 is entirely 
you know, reasonable in my opinion. And if I was going to bet this market, I'd play that 300. But uh, I bet, I think at least if you're going to get these low spreads for Denver the next two games, that's the way you want to play it as opposed to really getting wild in this, in the uh, correct series result market. Cause who knows, maybe, uh, uh, maybe they punt game five for no good reason and uh, win it in six. So it's still, uh, you know, s- still a lot of different uh, ways this could play out, but uh, count me still on board with the uh, Nuggets bandwagon in terms of uh, winning the title. Yeah, as, as we get further in the, c- the series, I think people are going to say Denver's going to want to win the NBA Finals at home. But to be honest with you, I think they're just going to want to <laughs> finish this as soon as possible, uh, take the championship. And we know Tyler Hero has been rolled out for game three, could come back for game four in Miami. Uh, but he did have that procedure done on his shooting hand, too. So uh, there's no telling how he looks when he does come back. But the Nuggets to win the finals right now is minus 275. The Heat to win it is plus 220. And uh, lastly, before we move on, uh, NBA Finals MVP, still Jokic. No debate there. Am I correct, Drew? Yeah, I, 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 it, that that is probably the real, you know, f- plus EV way to attack the series market uh, overall because uh, you're getting a little bit better price than the Nuggets to win. And at this point, I would say that that is a 99.9 percentile likelihood uh, that uh, it goes to him if the Nuggets do ultimately win. Yeah, I have to agree with you completely there. I think that's uh, something I'm probably going to play. And now before we get to talking about some tennis, the waking caches, uh, make sure you guys go ahead and download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. See the competition by favoring players on your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It's available in your app store today. And uh, if you need help with fantasy, don't come to me because I still had Alec Manoa on my fantasy team up until a start ago. Uh, so, yeah, I've been on the road a little out quite often lately. Uh, you can also watch the French Open on NBC or stream it on Peacock. So, Drew, let's dive into it. Carlos Alcaraz, uh, Nozak Djokovic. There is some good tennis to be had all week. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, so uh, the French Open is it, – it, it's – it's an overstatement to say it's been a disaster for me from a betting standpoint, um, but it hasn't been good. Uh, and I realistically, I need jo- I need uh, Djokovic not just to win this t- specific match, but to win the title to salvage any kind of uh, bankroll here. It's, you know, wake and cash has been wake up and burn my bankroll for the most part uh, <laughs> this fortnight, which is not feel great. Uh, like, you know, and I keep getting hooked here left and right. Like Iga today against Coco is just it was never really a match so Iga had uh you know had the her head you know a clear uh, advantage i thought the entire time i laid six and a half games she wins by six like that's just kind of the way it's been going for me and uh you know so it's it's uh, it's been a rough fortnight but this uh djokovic alcaraz match it doesn't even really matter if you like tennis or not you should tune into this because this is an incredibly unique match for ways that I could go on and on for hours. Djokovic is one of the most, he's, he is the, the most decorated men's tennis player of all time. 22 slams. This is his 430th best of five match. He's going up against Carlos Alcaraz, who is a meaningful favorite, despite the fact that he has one slam and has played 35 best of five matches in his career. Uh, and so you have these two players who are, le- you know, legitimately each at peak of their powers in different ways uh, and at completely different ends of their career. Uh, And, you know, Alcaraz on the Ascension doesn't really have the experience at this level, doesn't really, but he doesn't know any better. He's not afraid. He's completely fearless out there. And he's hitting shots that, uh, you know, yesterday against uh, Stefano Sissipas in particular, he's hitting shots that I'd never seen tennis players ever make before. Uh, And it's just, it's incredible to think of what the potential of this player ultimately will be. Uh, And then on the entire other end of the spectrum, Djokovic has so much know-how and so much mental, uh, you know, advantage over the rest of the field because of his ability to navigate best of five tennis, that it's just, he is an extremely difficult player to beat. Uh, And so this is a really unique matchup that, and we've never seen these players uh, match up in best of five. We've only seen them play each other once on clay, and it was over a year ago when Alcaraz was still in development mode. He, oh, by the way, beat Djokovic in that match, but Djokovic, I thought, was a little bit under the weather in terms of physical peak. So uh, this is a, a true test, uh, and I think my fair price in this match is closer to a pick That is entirely kind of buoyed by the fact that I think Djokovic experience matters. Uh, and so I think plus 165 is a fair play uh, to bet, you know, to back Djokovic here. And I honestly think you're going to get a better price in 
the you know Djokovic sets market because Alcaraz has so much youth and so much so, such a physical advantage because of the, the uh, you know disparity in age uh, that if this goes to five sets, I don't know that Djokovic has the legs. Uh, and so I think realistically, Djokovic has to win this three zero or three one. Uh, my guess is that he lets Alcaraz kind of come out and fire some of his bolts in the first set and then turns things around in the second set and ultimately wins 3-1. Uh, so I don't mind playing you know, Djokovic minus one and a half sets here. Uh, just under the uh, you know understanding that if this does go to five, all of a sudden I'm basically cashing out every Djokovic ticket I have because I'm not feeling especially confident he's going to be able to get across the finish line. Um, but this is going to be one of the most epic tennis matches we've had in the last five years uh, i would hold this up at, you know against you know djokovic versus federer on grass in wimbledon uh from a handful of years ago as sort of a true test of some of two potential you know one sure all-time great and a potential all-time great at opposite ends of their career so uh i really can't say enough about how important and how uh you know how enter entertaining this match is going to be and hopefully i don't build it up too much and it lets us down but uh this is going to be an absolute war and i can't wait for it yeah, I mean, Carlos, 20 years old, Novak, 36. I feel like Novak's been around my entire life. I mean, he has been around my entire life. Uh, but he's been, you know, sought of as the best tennis player out there. So he's – those two are the favorites also when the men, men's outright. You said you need Novak. He's sitting at plus 200. Carlos is minus 160. You got some other guys in there, though. Uh, Holger Rune, uh, Kasper Rude. Uh, what do you think about this market? Is it still Novak or pass? Yeah, I, and realistically, Alcaraz Djokovic is your de facto final. Whoever wins that match is going to be something like minus 500 in the final against whoever okay. comes off the bottom half here. Um, Zverev right now beating Echeverry looks like he is going to punch his ticket to a semifinal. Uh, we're going to find out later today about Rune Rude, which is uh, that's kind of an interesting, fun little rivalry between two younger players as well. A little bit of aggro between those uh, two guys from Denmark and Norway. You wouldn't think Scandinavian countries would produce that much aggro, but those guys don't really like each other. Um, so that'll be a fun one. Uh, and I think realistically, I, if I had to make a prediction, I think Rune comes through. I think Rune can beat Zverev surely. Uh, and I think Djokovic likely gets the better of either of those players in the final. But um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, I, I have a much, much less uh, sincere read on the bottom half of the draw than I do uh, without Krez Djokovic, where I just feel like that should, I feel like it should be a coin flip. Uh, and I feel like that uh, particular semifinal will decide your French Open title. And that match is Thursday morning, 4 a.m. Eastern time. I'll have to wake up one hour earlier, Drew. Darn you. Uh, but from what you said, it sounds like it's all worth it. So Yeah, they haven't in. they haven't put they haven't put out the uh, order of play yet. It's probably gonna be later than that. All right. Well, let's go to the women's outright. There's a lot of money to be made there too. I know my girl uh Sabalenka is playing and she's not the favorite. Uh she's the co favorite. Uh so what do you make of this market in general? Is there anybody that you're riding with? Yeah, I have some Sabalenka in pocket from pre-draw. And, you know, when we broke down the draw, it was pretty clear that there was an imbalance where the bottom was weaker. Sabalenka was the clear best player. And so we got her at price at that time, expecting that Ego was going to have a much tougher path to the finals. Well, number one, a lot of the tougher players in Ego's way have all crashed out of the tournament, either through illness, injury, or just really suspect performances. And so it has actually been a little bit of a cakewalk to the final for Ego. She has not yet to really be tested. I guess her closest match was ostensibly today against Coco Goff, even though it wasn't much of a match. Uh, and I think, you know, she, minus 225, if you're looking for a parlay piece, you can do worse. It should probably be minus 400. I think Iga very comfortably beats Beatriz Haddad Maya in the semifinals. Uh, and I think Iga is going to ultimately be in the minus 400 range against Sabalenka in the finals. So uh, that's kind of the only way you can realistically look at this market at this point. Iga is building, getting better. She has definitely the advantage over Sabalenka on this court speed. Uh, and, uh, you know, even though I am holding Sabalenka futures, I feel very. Um, pessimistic i suppose that it ultimately will get there in the end and ego has got a match coming up tomorrow to thursday 10 15 you're gonna have a best bet in that one am i right yeah so best i can tell you as far as what's available to bet for tomorrow's tennis uh i laid the six and a half games i said Iga, i think will win comfortably over beatrice Haddad Maya. she's six and a half game favorite at plus 105 right now 
I think that's worth a play. Beatriz Haddad Maya, congratulations for making it this far in a slam that's off of your specific, you know, strength in terms of surface. But uh, having played three, almost four hours of tennis t- uh, two days ago and then another, you know, two and a half hour physical match today, uh, I think she is in for a rude awakening uh, as Iga brings her peak stuff so that she can save some of her bolts for the final. And I think uh, Iga gets it done in straights. So wouldn't be surprised to see a, a 6 0 or 6 1 in there. So laying the six and a half games is my straight, my, uh, my most straightforward approach for waking cash i like it i like it i'm about to ride that with you there so we got some good plus money and both the men's and the women's from you drew so uh let's wake up early and let's make some money together my friend <laughs> i like I love it. it i like it i also like sunday mlb leadoffs they've been very fun for me betting those personally the diamondbacks are making the journey from the arizona desert to the motor city for a battle with those detroit tigers both teams hope to move up in their divisions, but only one will rise on Sunday morning. Find out who by streaming the MLB leadoff Sunday. Live at ML, MLB Peacock, 11 a.m. Drew, we've been making some money in MLB Sundays, and I think uh, that'll continue for me here. Uh, but this is going to be an interesting part of the show because we're going to have a guest, Dr. Gregory Barroza. He introduced and performed the first arthroscopic and surgical procedure at the University of Pennsylvania College of Veterinary Medicine. He's been a horse racing analyst for decades, and he's here to talk about the Belmont Stakes. So, Dr. Gregory Barroza, how are you doing today? Thanks. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, Drew Vaughn, good to catch up with you. Yeah, likewise. And uh, we have a lot to go over at the Belmont Stakes. We got the favorite Forte at 5-2. to two. Uh, We'll scratch from the Kentucky Derby. A lot of people were surprised they're a favorite. We talked about a little Tapatrice off air and how that's been the sharp play. So what do you think about Forte here? And the health of this horse uh, for the, for this race, I think he's going to be solid. I, he's had ten weeks off, but uh, Todd hasn't sat on the sidelines and done nothing with him. He's addressed this supposedly bruised foot, and depending upon what the real facts are, we only hear the the media blurbs of what's going on. It appeared to be a simple uh, bruise to the heel, which under other years where there wasn't such speculation about injuries, I think uh, he probably would have run the horse and would have had a shot with the horse. There's various ways of corrective shoeing and pads and all sorts of ways to make him feel good. Just no different than the star quarterback of an NFL uh, team getting sidelined for 10 minutes to go back in the dressing room and come out and all of a sudden be playing again. We, we have to do the same things to keep them going. All legit. And uh, I spoke to Todd uh, just a couple of days ago, and he said that he has modified his training program to fit this horse. You know, he's He's probably the best thoroughbred trainer in the world today, uh, standing maybe a second uh, questionably with Bob Baffert in his in his uh, proficiency. Uh, Todd has won the Belmont four times. Uh, His jockey, Irad Ortiz, is a top New York jockey, won it twice. And it's interesting, but the two of them won on Mo Donegal last year. So now will they repeat it this year? The question is, we'll see. It's not an easy hat trick, but it's amazing. It's a 50th anniversary of Secretariat. And in 72 and 73, Lucian Lauren Trainer and Ron Turcotte Jockey won with Reva Ridge in 72 and Secretariat in 73, back mm. to back. So it's just coincidence, but it, it'd be kind of uh, cosmic if uh, Pletcher won in a second year in a row. And I'm sure he'd love that vindication. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't ever hear that story before. That's fascinating trivia. Um, Forte was a bet against in the Derby just because of his price and how big that field was. This is obviously a narrower field, uh, but I, I definitely worry a little bit about rust. Um, Forte did seem like he was kind of pointed to and peaking for the Derby, and uh, I know it's tough to say we haven't seen the best of uh, you know best of what he's got to offer. Whereas there is another Todd Pletcher horse in this race who we almost certainly have not seen the best of, and that is Tapa Trice, who is three to one in the second choice um Tappa trace is kind of still learning in a lot of ways how to be a racehorse how to be a thoroughbred how to get break out of the gate uh like there is still pretty clearly a ceiling that we just have not seen with this horse and i'm curious if you think that the longer distance of the belmont stakes in any way shape or form opens the door for a tap at trice to be able to uh bring his you know style which is uh you know he takes a little while to get going uh but then once he is going he could potentially come down the home stretch like an absolute locomotive um is any of this ring true with what you see and hear about tap at trice or do you think he's just not at the maturity stage where he is a realistic uh, you know, contender to win this very, very, very competitive race. 
I think Tappet Trice is my third best horse in the race. Hmm. Um, he, Todd Pletcher has been saying all along, even in his two-year-old career, that this horse really just needs to mature. I was there for the Fountain of Youth. I was there for the Florida Derby. I saw him gut out at the Florida Derby and just beat Mage at the finish wire. And I was there for the post-press conference where even the owner said that somehow I read Ortiz pulled out an extra an extra little distance, a half a length or whatever it took to win. It, was, it seemed impossible. Everyone thought he was going to lose the race to Mage. But Tapatrice is a bigger horse. He has in his yeah. bloodlines uh, a lot of the unbridled, unbridled song bloodlines. They're bigger horses. They're usually um, come from behind. They have to get the momentum going. There was criticism of that with Secretariat in 73, that he wasn't fast out of the starting gate necessarily. He tried to stay with the pack. And then, except in the Belmont, when he took the lead and Swale tried to stay with him the whole time till he broke down. But in general, when you have a bunch of talented speedsters, and there are some speedsters in the race, I don't expect Tappet Trice to be out there right away. I think he's going to let his motor go and go and go. He also has an inside post position, too, which in races other than a mile and a half might be a little bit of a disadvantage. But in a mile and a half, these jockeys can make up wherever they need to be as long as he doesn't get trapped. I like that. I was going to ask you, since you kind of talked about Tapa Trice being your third horse here, does National Treasure sneak into your top three? Because after winning Preakness two weeks ago, now that's the third favorite here, or third on, third in, in terms of odds on favorite at five to one. Well, National Treasure right now for me, you know, I don't make a living as a handicapper. But I see these horses on the track, and he, he's in my top four. He's in my okay. top four. He'd be my fourth right now. But I got to tell you straight, any one of those guys can jump up and win. Picking a, picking a racehorse winner is like picking a winning stock. I mean, we see trends. We analyze. We do all these things. All I can tell you from a health perspective and performance. But certainly Bob Baffert, like I mentioned, is an equal to Todd Pletcher as far as a trainer. Now, he did the same thing with another horse uh, years ago named Arrogate that came in and, and beat the pants off everyone in the Travers. He he comes from the West Coast, which they favor these speedsters. So I do believe that National Treasure is going to take the lead. And in fact, I discussed that with Todd Pletcher a little bit because it's interesting. Todd's go-to guy for most of the years that he made all these big uh, achievements was Johnny Velasquez, the jockey. Now, Johnny's sitting on Baffert's horse. And so I said, so is that going to change things? Johnny knows your way of training and your way of strategizing as well as anyone. And Todd's answer was, and I know Johnny as well as anyone. So I think Todd to me is like a machine as far as his mind. He strategizes everything. I can't even keep up with the stats. He could tell you who came third in a race five years ago to one of his horses and tell you the times. I, I, it's beyond my ability. You know, I compare him a little bit to an Elon Musk. He's that he's that brilliant. So he's going to give it his best shot. And as you say, there's a little bit of a retribution feeling here because he loved nothing better than to get a one, two. I think that um, Forte is definitely the favorite. I mean, that'd be like saying you're watching a boxing match and Muhammad Ali's in it. You're going to put him third. I mean, you know, it does, he, he's coming in with all the superstar tendencies. In fact, going into the Derby, I, I really thought, he was going to be our next triple crown winner. I mean, that's how much potential this horse had. But I put him as a first, and probably I, I put um, uh, Brad Cox's horse as a second, uh, and I put Tappet Trice as a third, and I put National Treasures as a fourth. After that, I don't know. If you ask me to pick a long shot, I'd pick this Archangelo just because I don't know much about the horse, and they have a lot of confidence in him. And, you know, that he's an arrogant bred to a Tappet mare, we can go into that. This isn't a program about breeding, but everyone thinks if you own a Tappet bloodline, you own a winner. <laughs> Not necessarily true, but Tappet, they forget, goes back in the history all the way to Secretariat and goes to AP Indy and horses like that. So even Secretariat going into the Belmont, everyone said he's never going to make a mile and a half, but they said that going into the Derby. He's never going to get behind a, a mile, mile and eighth like his, his uh, sire, Bold Ruler. He blew the doors off everyone because the female line, Prince Quillo was the female sire. Uh, Something Royal was the name of the mayor. Anyway, that was a side of the, the genetics that gave him stamina. And we have to remember one thing here. None of these horses have ever raced a mile and a half before. So 
who knows who's going to make that last half mile. The most that any of them have gone is like a mile and a quarter. So who's going to make that last quarter of a mile? There's a few in the race that have already raced at a quarter of a mile. They'll probably have the same performance. That's that's my summation of the way I, I see it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I've always talked the breeding part of the conversation for a lot of races. It doesn't really matter. But for the Belmont, it does. <laughs> it's kind of it's one of those secret sort of secret sauce, if uh, particularly among the people who've been doing this a long time. So well, uh, yeah. just so you know, that's that's how many of the people that buy these horses and train them in the industry. They they look for these horses with these certain bloodlines. Now, I agree with you a thousand percent that there's a lot of very well-bred horses that don't really fire at the track. But it's interesting, some of the greatest ones went to the breeding shed and produced horses that did fire at the track. So I don't discount it, but but you'll hear over and over again, it's a tap at mare, it's a tap at stallion, all that. What I'm saying to you is I look at the performance just like you, but I always remember that you can't prejudge whether it was or wasn't at a tap at how it's going to do. Yeah, that, that, I could I couldn't agree more. I I will tell you the pace of the race and honestly what you saw from National Treasure at the Preakness was I, you know, wasn't fluky in the race, but boy oh boy was that sort of the ideal field and the ideal slow pace to kind of let you know National Treasure go wire to wire. Do not see that breaking you know coming to fruition at all in this particular race so he's an aggressive toss to me. I think he's going to get run down uh, by a lot of these very very uh, you know you know well-regarded closers i'm not feeling angel of empire i think that price is a little bit short uh some general concerns about his ultimate stamina and some of the you know some of the breeding uh you know dosage index would tell you he may not be made for this particular length um and you know i i agree with you that forte you know he ought to be at or near the top uh you know in terms of the odds board but for me i'm going to take a take a swing on tap at trice i think three to one is a fair play and uh and just in general if you know with the smaller field and with his ability to kind of put together a closing run here i think he's uh going to be a, you know be able to put together a pretty special uh saturday so the uh, tap at trice in the two for me um, somewhat based on price because I think he's maybe just a nose behind Forte in terms of, uh, you know, where you want to be in terms of, you know, win, win share here. But, um, yeah, going to be a fun one. Yeah, we did say that was going to be the sharp play here. And Dr. Burroughs, before we get you out of here, any concern at all with the track conditions and the weather of this race? Because we know it's supposed to be okay race day, but leading up to that, uh, it's going to be pretty wet. Well, Belmont Park's been around to – longer than me, and they know how to prepare for these things. They know how to seal tracks and do things like that. I think especially with all the spotlight on track safety now, especially with the injuries from the Kentucky Derby, uh, the crew at Belmont is going to do their best to make sure there's no glitches whatsoever. And there's going to be probably more veterinarians than need be only because it's like too many cooks in the in the uh, kitchen. They'll be all over the place making sure all these horses are eligible to run. That's sort of what caught Forte that you know, he just got caught in another year. He probably would have been running. Um, so do I worry about the track conditions? Not overly. I'm always worried about safety on horses and jockeys and the conditions. I Every time I do an interview with these guys, I wish them the best and a safe trip because I think that the jockeys are the toughest athletes in the world. They're, they, they have to stay fit 24-7 for their entire career, and it, it's not an easy task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, doctor, my grandma always said there's never too many cooks in the kitchen if the food is good. So I wouldn't worry about that too much there. I hope <laughs> you enjoy your time. I want to ask you, where can we find more of your content and uh, be looking for you? Well, just go to my website, www.wuzupdoc.com and go to Talking Horses. I have a number of YouTubes, uh, Arrogate uh, winning the Travers and horses like that, American Pharaoh winning the Triple Crown. But the one I'm most proud of is a recent one. I did an hour interview with all the principal people involved with Secretariat. This is the 50th year anniversary of Secretariat uh, beating Sham, and I have all his connections in there too. The other thing people are forgetting is also, um, I think it's the 45th year that uh, Aladar and Affirmed race in, a, in, we don't consider it a match race, but it was the equivalent of Secretariat and Sham. And um, a phenomenal job with Aladar coming second, losing only by two lengths in all three races combined. Amazing, amazing feat, overshadowed now by Secretariat's anniversary. I love that. And that's what's up, doc.com and talking horses on YouTube. We appreciate you, Dr. Barroza, for coming on. Hopefully, we see you again soon. Enjoy the races. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.
And Drew, it's a lot for a show. We got we cover three different sports here. <laughs> Uh, so recapping my best bets, the under, I'm gonna sprinkle the nuggets money line as well. A little nuggets series price. What are you liking, uh, before we leave the viewers? Uh, yeah, as a recap, I laid three and I laid six and a half with the nuggets tonight, hoping for a win with margin. Uh, and, uh, in wake and cash, I got Ega laying six and a half games. So a chalky Wednesday for me, uh, on the, on the, uh, bet the edge. Uh, I love to hear it, man. We got some tap of trice in our pockets might even watch some horse racing and tennis this weekend from me drew you guys bring out the best of me man but that's why i do this show with you so don't forget to check out nbc sports edge.com for more info hope you guys out with your wagers thank you for tuning in on our nbc sports youtube channel if you're listening podcast form don't forget to subscribe and rate us as always from vaughn and drew and dr barosa thank you as always see you next time